Hi guys and many thanks for joining. My name is Kat and I like to talk about crime investigations and missing people. If you are new to my channel, please don't forget to subscribe below. Hit that notification bell so you are the first one to know about any new videos I upload. Like and share the video. Thank you. Hi guys and thanks for joining me. Today I want to talk to you about Nakota Kelly. He was a really, really sweet little boy, only 10 years old and he died at the hands of his father. A father, the same figure who you usually expect safety, love and to look after you. And of course you see your father as a role model, especially if you are a little boy. But in, in Nakota's case, unfortunately, his dad was the end of him. The question is, was there any remorse? Let's find out. My dad is going to kill me, terrified the little boy, told his mother just a few days before Anthony Dibia killed him. Now let's get a bit back in the past. In December 2017, Haley, Nakota's mother, posted on Facebook that she hated there was no one out there to help kids anymore. For several years, Haley, who has full custody over Nakota, was trying to prevent 37 years old Anthony, his dad, from having court-ordered visitation with their 10-year-old son. There was one point when she actually refused Nakota to go visit his dad. However, later the police got involved and she was forced to let him go to his dad. Now, in June 2018, Haley made another Facebook post saying how she was stressing about what happened when she picked Nakota up from Anthony. He spat in her face, threatening to beat her ass if she ever tells him again not to beat his son. Haley also went on mentioning that the child protection services didn't do anything on a previous occasion to uh, protect uh, Nakota when Nakota's dad overdosed him and then on a separate occasion when he, when he pulled Nakota down the stairs and left bruises on his hand, Haley couldn't find a way to stop the visits although she even went uh, as far as uh, speaking to the judge and saying that she was uh, terrified of Anthony and this ladies and gentlemen shows how the system works you tell the right people about your fears and about your about your genuine fears and nothing is being done you expect you expect safety and protection and you are just dismissed the signs were there I mean, really, the signs were there. When was this this Facebook post? Oh, yes, this was in 2018, which is two years ago. The signs were there, people. And yet, a life was lost, easily prevented, if only someone would have listened. If only the right people to prevent Nakota dying would have listened. In late August 2018, Haley posts yet again on Facebook. This time, Anthony hit Nakota. And she didn't know what to do or where to go. In January 2019, she posted an image that read, I would give my last breath so my child could have another. Now, you need to understand that Haley, she is the type of mom who bakes cakes for her kids' birthdays, who spends hours trying to learn how to style their hair and basically basically her whole Facebook is around her kids. Most of the posts that she has are with the kids. Last week Nakota who lived in Wabash, Indiana with his mom and the 13 year old half sister made an alarming statement to his mom. After he found out he would uh, go in the weekend for visitation to his dad, he was terrified. He knew his father won't forget that Nakota hang, hang up the phone on him when they had the last phone conversation because uh, he, ju he just didn't want to talk to him, so he hung up. On July 14th, Haley contacted Child Services yet again after being informed Nakota will be spending the weekend with his dad in, in Indianapolis. His reply was, oh, I'm dead. Don't expect me to come home. 
Usually, if you hear a kid say that, you don't really think much of it, right? I mean, kids say these kind of things all the time. But it seems like Nakota, on this occasion, he actually predicted what would happen to him. And it did. Nakota told his mother, he's going to kill me. Now, listen to me. Before you put all the blame on Haley, the mom, please stop. Just stop. Okay? We already know the mom tried before, remember when the police forced Nakota to go to his dad? She already tried before to stop these visitations, but the, the police got involved and the police forced Nakota to go visit his dad. What? Oh, I lost the light. It wouldn't have been any different this time either if she would have uh, stopped him from going the police will still come back and the police would still force him to go i know it's easy to place the blame on someone especially after what happened and also without actually being in that situation you wouldn't know how you would react in that situation if the police forces you you can't risk getting yourself in jail then what would happen with the kids? Usually, you know, kids say, oh, my mom or my dad, oh my God, they're going to kill me if they did something wrong. But they don't literally mean it. Who could have known this will happen? Look, as an example, I can say my dad, he hit me as a child. My husband's dad hit him as a child. My dad didn't kill me. My husband's dad didn't kill, kill him. And also my dad's dad, which is my grandfather, hit my dad as a child. But still, he didn't kill him. I'm not saying he's right, it's not right, but you don't expect that from a parent to kill his own child. You just don't. I actually feel very sorry for Haley because all of these years she tried to do everything to prevent and stop these visits but the system failed her, the system failed Nakota, just like the system failed so many other innocent kids who died at the hands of their parents or relatives. A well-known example is Gabriel Fernandez, an eight-year-old little boy killed by his mom and his boyfriend in 2013. If you haven't heard about this, about this case, I will be making another video about this but there is a documentary on Netflix where I'm going to put the link for it in the description below. If you are interested in it please uh, make sure that you watch it but it's a very upsetting documentary. I did watch it and believe me I was crying my eyes out. In Gabriel Fernandez case the social services, the child protection services, they were called on so many separate occasions, even by his teacher, but nothing happened. He was allowed by the system to die. The same system which is supposed to protect children f from abuse, but it didn't. But there's more. There was a period of time, around a year, when Haley never heard anything again from Anthony. And then all of a sudden, he got in touch with her to ask for a DNA test to prove that uh, actually Nakota is his child. A couple of years later, he was granted visitation. It seems that almost immediately he began abusing Nakota, who didn't have the easiest life to begin with. He was having difficulties breathing when sleeping. In 2014, he had surgery. He was also diagnosed with severe ADHD, sensory processing disorder, pervasive developmental disorder, a mild learning disability related to autism, and speech impediment. At one point, he was on medication for his conditions. We've seen it so many times. Children with mood behavior or learning difficulties are at much higher risk of parental abuse. They can be harder to deal with. But this is not an excuse to kill your own flesh and blood. No, it's not an excuse. Haley dealt with, uh, with Nakota's conditions. Anthony didn't. The, why did he want visitations then? I mean, he was the one who in the first place asked for it. He wanted to know if Nakota was his son. Anyway, Nakota ended up spending the weekend with his father, although he expressed that he didn't want to. Saturday, July the 18th, 
In the evening, Anthony's cousin from Texas receives a phone call from Anthony. It's worth mentioning that they haven't spoken in the last uh, for 20 years. They haven't spoken until they started communicating again around a month earlier. Anthony was crying on the phone and he told his cousin, repeating it over and over again, I just killed my son, I killed my son. At the same time, Anthony asked for his cousin's address and when the cousin refused, Anthony got really upset, so the cousin hung up the phone. I wonder why did he ask for the address? Maybe he wanted to ask for his help to dispose of uh, Nakota's body? According to court documents, when the witness asked Anthony why he did it, Anthony replied, his son's mother had given him a very hard time and had cost him a lot of money in court. Over money? Nakota, his 10-year-old boy, he dies over money? His dad kills him over some court fees? Money? Oh my God! This is just unbelievable. Just after 10 p.m. on Saturday night, Indi Indianapolis police goes to Anthony's house at Ashton Point Apartments, 6007 West Lake South Drive for a welfare check. They see the car parked, they, they knock on the door of apartment E, no one answers, but they hear voices and some noise inside, so they leave without forcing entry. Is that how they perform welfare checks? By leaving? Aren't they supposed to make sure that the boy is fine? Aren't they supposed to actually see the child they go to do the welfare check for? Now this was a big mistake. On Sunday morning, July the 19th, police receive yet another report, this time from Anthony's friend. He called his friend in the same morning to ask for a suitcase, to which the friend agreed. The friend then, ten then tells police, Anthony then tells him he used a bag to suffocate his son until he stopped breathing. This is according to Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Detective Jonathan Schultz in a probable cause affidavit filed in Marion Superior Court. The document continued. Anthony told the friend he then took his son to the bathroom to make sure he was dead and he has now dumped the body. What is that supposed to mean to make sure that he was dead? I mean, he su suffocated him until he stopped breathing. When police arrived at the address a second time at around 11.45 in the morning, Anthony's vehicle was no longer parked at the location. This time, after the second report, police deemed the situation serious enough to gain access to the department, to the apartment. So they did after they got the key from the management. I'm just... So now when Anthony's car is gone, they decide to go in? Hmm, wouldn't, wouldn't that have been easier if they just did that on Saturday, the first time when actually Anthony was home and they could have checked then and maybe they could have saved Nakota's life? Inside, obviously, as can be expected, there was no Anthony and no Nakota. But what they found was a scene like in the horror movies. They effectively stepped into a crime scene. There was a small amount right at the entrance, but worse, in the bathroom, police found blood splattered walls, blood on the ceiling, blood on the floor, and brain matter on the bathroom floor. So I need to ask this question. If he suffocated his son with a bag over his head until he stopped breathing, why so much blood everywhere in that bathroom? Is that what he meant when he told his friend that he took him in the bathroom to make sure he was dead? What did he do? Did he smash his head? I mean, for God's sake, why would you do that? The boy stopped breathing. He stopped breathing, for God's sake. Why do you have to do this? Why couldn't you just stop when you saw that he stopped breathing? Why did you have to crack his head? Based on the evidence found inside, 
authorities do not believe uh, Nakota to be alive. IMPD homicide detectives, child abuse detectives, oh yeah, now after the fact, child, child abuse detectives, a bit too late, don't you think? And the forensic team, alongside the Marion County coroner, were brought to the scene. Investigators got hold of video footage showing Anthony making quite a few trips to his car and back to his apartment, placing uh, some items in the back of his vehicle with each trip. During one of the trips, he is seen throwing a bag in the co communal dumpster. I wonder what was in the bag. Did the police even check the dumpster? I couldn't really find uh, too many information about this. He was probably disposing of, of things that would incriminate him. Now, between 2.27 a.m. and 8.30 a.m. on July the 19th, his vehicle is seen, leave, is seen leaving the parking lot and returning quite a few times. On the same day, Haley contacted the D DCS caseworker, Child Protection Services, again after she received a text message from Anthony at 2.01 p.m. And the message read, Sometimes I hear voices. My son is in heaven. Now, <laughs> how much do you want to bet that he will try to plead insanity? He's trying to set up the insanity defense. I think that this is what he's trying to do. Although I'm not so sure how it would work out. I mean, he was lucid enough to make a call and ask for a suitcase and also to admit to his cousin that he killed Nakota. On the other hand, though, he might just plead insanity on the basis that from so much stress with all the, the court, uh, with uh, all the court attendances and all the money he spent in court, as uh, he mentioned uh, that Haley, he's, she's been uh, for years and years going through court to stop the visitations. He spent all those money. He got to the point where he had to declare himself bankrupt. He didn't have any more money to pay his lawyer. So he might bring that reason up that because of that much stress, he couldn't think clearly anymore. Hmm. He can also very well say that he has no recollection of what happened, that he was in a moment of rage or he wasn't thinking clearly. I mean, you never know. He had so much time to plan. After the search in the apartment, investigators traced uh, Anthony's cell phone location and were able to say he was driving through Illinois toward the Missouri border. At around 4 p.m., Anthony Dibia was located and detained when the Missouri State Highway Patrol saw him traveling alone in his white Jeep Patriot near Highway 38. The detective traveled to Missouri to follow up, but Anthony refused to give a statement. I wonder if at this point uh, Anthony in fact contacted a uh, lawyer and he probably asked for advice from a lawyer, hence uh, he refused to make a statement. But anyway, in the end, Anthony Daibaya was arrested and charged with murder in the presumed death of 10-year-old boy Nakota Blake Kelly. He was transported to Macon County Jail. Marion County prosecutor said a conviction would result in a life without parole or the death penalty. Investigators sadly are still searching for Nakota's body, Nakota's remains. Anthony's phone pinged near Eagle Creek around the 4500 block of West Vermont Avenue. Police searched the area, spending several hours on Monday searching heavily wooded areas near Eagle Creek with the assistance of canines whilst a helicopter passed repeatedly overhead. They didn't have any luck so far, unfortunately. Community members gathered on Monday at around 5.30 p.m. in the parking lot of the Bachelor Creek Church of Christ for a prayer vigil for the safe return of Nakota, who attended the church. Nakota Blake Kelly was born on May 25, 2010 at 7 pounds and 10 ounces. Nakota was a happy, playful little boy with an utterly charming smile, gorgeous brown eyes, curly black hair 
and glasses. He played baseball for the Wabash Little League, but he loved other sports too, like bowling, football and wrestling. He also loved the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for most of his life. He and his older sister, they always bickered with each other, but they did love spending uh, time with each other. They enjoyed the, each other's company. They enjoyed all their games and how much they were playing with each other. Nakota was, according to his mom, a mama's boy. Whenever Haley was sick, he refused to leave her side. Of course, being a 10-year-old boy, he also loved video games. During Monday's night uh, baseball game, Nakota's team, the Pirates, saved a spot for him on the roster and also on the field and the moment of silence was held for him. One friend from church remembered about Nakota and he said, he had a smile you cannot forget. He was always dressed like a little gentleman. He was ornery and kept me on my toes. I loved his spunky yet sometimes bashful personality. I'm heartbroken. I'm so thankful we know who holds this precious boy now until he can be reunited with those who loved him dearly. The IMPD is asking the community for assistance in this case. If anyone has any information or has seen Anthony Dibia since July the 18th, please contact Crime Stoppers of Central Indiana at 317-262. TIPS. Please share as much as you can. Maybe someone knows something. At this moment, I'm not aware of any GoFundMe going on uh, around uh, Nakota's uh, memorial yet. However, if you do want to leave any flowers, contributions may be made to the family. You can leave a tribute prayers and condolences or any or express any problem you might have in the comment section below i would really really appreciate if you guys could share this video as much as you can using any social media that's available with the video i think that the more people will get to see this maybe maybe there will be someone who actually knows something or saw something and maybe the police will be able to find Nakota's remains so her mom, his family and his friends can get some closure. Many thanks for watching. Take care. Bye.